Through the prophet Moses, God spoke to his people. There is none like God who rides through the heavens to your help, through the skies and his majesty. The eternal God is your dwelling place and underneath are the everlasting arms. The psalmist also reminds us that the one who rides through the heavens to help us is the same one who is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. Even on a cross, he cared for his mother, saying to his beloved disciple, Behold your mother, and to his mother, behold your son. Our God is not only sovereign, but sympathetic. Not only omnipotent and omniscient, but compassionate. There is none like God, who will ride through the heavens to your help, to assure comfort, strengthen, and even to bless us as we gather to give thanks for Margaret Middleton's life. My name is Darren Middleton on behalf of the whole family here in, in the UK, who have, some of them will be watching and live streaming. I just want to thank you all for attending today. For those who have helped in preparation for the service, who prepared food and served in the service, we also give thanks to God for you and your kindness towards us. Many have travelled to be here. Some have come up interstate from long distances. And again, thank you for that. And it's a great encouragement to us as a family. Our hope today is that we're going to have an opportunity to remember and to give thanks for mum's life, but also to find hope in the promises of God. After the service, there's going to be a light luncheon. So uh, please stay, mingle, catch up, and... Um, and avail yourselves of that opportunity. If you're uh, through those double doors, if you turn right, there's a cry room. That's where you'll find me, probably. Uh, but if you were to meander a little bit past that turn right, you'll find toilets. So you can make use of those if you need to. And again, please stay after the service for a time of fellowship. Well, Christians believe that God is both sovereign and good. And that if we come to him in faith, that he hears us in our prayers. So I'm going to lead you now in a time of prayer where we seek God's blessing and comfort. Let's pray. Our gracious King, would you ride through the heavens to our help? Would you meet us today to comfort us with the gospel? 
Would you draw near to us, especially those who are broken hearted? Would you take away our sin, our sorrow, our regrets? And would you speak to us with gospel hope? For you have promised to be near those who are grieving and crushed in spirit. So be near us this morning. Would you grant to us faith and grace that we might have hope in this hour, strength for this day, that we beyond the grave know that there with a, an absolute certainty that death is not the last word, but Christ has had the last word and there is eternal life for all those who look to you and love you. We thank you that by your grace, mum did that. So, our Heavenly Father, minister to us this morning, be gracious to us, and do it in such a way that we might all be able to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Well, let's say and we'll sing our first song of praise, Amazing Grace.
we take the opportunity to remember mum, uh, commonly called a eulogy, uh, give thanks for her life, we'll follow after that. Uh, I'm going to say a few words and then I'm going to invite my wife after me to say a few words. I also want to thank my auntie Marty. I just had contact with her during the week and just to make sure I get some of the, the details correct, especially from the UK days. Uh, Mum was born in 1932. She lived to a good age, 90 years, uh, four score and ten. So we can praise God for that. She was born as the second eldest of 11 children. She grew up in Jarrow in the middle of the North Depression. Unemployment and poverty were ubiquitous. And it led to what became very famous, at least in that part of England, called the Jarrow March in 1936. And similar marches were all around London, around the UK, called Hunger Marches. Mum's family became very well known at that time because a, a well-known photographer who was doing work on this issue uh, published photographs of her family and their home to illustrate poverty in the north of England. During the war, mum and two sisters, Jennifer and Sylvia, were evacuated. Uh, children were then taken by other families. Though, unfortunately, mum was separated from her two sisters. Uh, eventually, mum was actually taken by um, a Madison family who owned a, a bicycle shop. And uh, they were very nice, but she never settled. And somehow she convinced her dad to come and collect her, and she made her way back home. But mum had a... She had a good mind, but the situation at home, the extreme poverty that she lived in, meant that by 14, she left school and started working in a pie shop. Not only did the money help the family, but she got to bring home broken or unsold pies to help feed her siblings. After the war, mum married and had my eldest sister and brother, Viv and Owen, this was a hard and a sad time during her life and led to a long but temporary separation from the kids. In the 60s, mum joined the Territorial Army. You grace, you're in good company. She later married dad. Sean and I were both born at that time. In the 70s, we came to Australia to be near Viv and Owen. During this time, Mum was uh, very active in the union movement. You might have saw a picture of her with Bob Hawke. Uh, I'll tell you about the arguments we had about politics another day. But needs to say, uh, Mum was an extremely hard worker and she was well-liked. She was always industrious and she had a work ethic. I actually cannot remember her taking a day off work. So it was even pointless as a kid if you were sick trying to get a day of school. was not going to happen, not on her watch. It just simply wasn't an option. In later life, mum became a Christian. I had the joy of explaining the gospel to her uh, in her 60s. And even though it was a struggle when she first became a Christian, <laughs> it didn't lead to a, a few tensions with my dad, um, who blamed me for this turn of affairs. Um, it was a joy for me to watch her grow in her faith over the years. Mum was very active in a local Presbyterian church in Seaford for nearly 20 years. She had lifelong friendships there, none more so than her pastor and his wife, Gary and Peggy Vanatang, who are with us here this morning. Mum also spent during that time, and even when she came to Geelong, well over 20 years, uh, serving, volunteering in charity shops, both in Seaford and in Geelong. In 2011, we moved mum and dad to Geelong so we could be close to them in their older age. Mum's been a member here at NGPC for the last 10 or so years. And while she has loved being in Geelong and loved coming to NGPC, I'm pretty sure, Gary, you were still her favourite pastor, which is... Uh, Hard to work out, but anyway. What was mum like? There's a scattered view of her life, but, but what was she like? Well, she was loved, and she loved. She was a good daughter, sister, wife, mother. She was an exceptional nana. My kids can testify 
She was wonderful. She never, ever lost her love for her family in the UK. She was, would bang on about them all the time, the stories I've heard time and time again. And while she was especially close to her younger sister, Marty, she loved all of her family. And she was overjoyed when they had opportunity to come out to Australia. And she certainly went back three or four times visiting them as well. But mum not only loved people, she loved books. For those who know her, she loved books. She had a voracious appetite for reading books. Catherine Cookson was probably her favourite author whose novels, similar to mum's background, were based in the north of England during that depression and poverty and, and difficult times of mum's childhood. I'm pretty sure, I'm fairly confident to say, she read every single one that is 104 of Catherine Cookson's novels. She just loved history, genealogy, loved to read, hear, and to tell stories. One of her favourite TV shows was in the 1970s BBC drama called When a Boat Comes In. I was going to try and do it with a Geordie accent, but <laughs> it would fool no one. Uh, but she loved this show because, again, the reason it was, it was based on the life and relationships of those who lived in the north of England in poverty just after the war. It is hard to overstate how much mum's childhood shaped her. She was a real conversationalist too. Thousands and thousands of hours were spent around dinner tables just, just talking. And if dad was there arguing, especially if it was about economics or politics. Uh, mum, speaking of dad, loved him. She was loyal to my dad. They enjoyed 60 years together. My dad, in, <clears throat> in mum's latter years, he was a champion at looking after her. Side of dad I hadn't seen a lot of. But his care of mum was inspirational. And for that, we're all thankful to God. As a mother, uh, mum was uh, tactile and kind. She was uh, talkative, warm. She was quick to forgive. Couldn't hold a grudge. Quick to forgive and forget. She loved nothing more than long, meandering conversations about family or friends or history. In fact, pretty much anything except sport. To be honest, mum, as a mother, was a tad soft. Um, it's fair to say my brother Sean and I pushed the boundaries a bit further with my mum than we would dare do with my dad. Uh, she wasn't a pushover, and she certainly remember many times she threatened violence with a slipper. Uh, in fact, I'm pretty sure between the two of us, a couple of slippers were thrown in our direction. Mostly my brother's fault, of course. But we were, the truth is, we were rat bags as kids in a way, but boy, did we love our mum. Mum was fastidiously clean to a fault. She had these ridiculously high standards of cleanliness, which was totally incompatible given there was so much testosterone in our house. I remember as a teenager, she made me a deal. She was going to give me $10 a week pocket money if I was to clean the house every Friday as soon as I come home from school and before she got home from work. Now, I couldn't believe it because $10 in 1980 was an absolute jackpot. I mean, my mum was a generous employer. But what I was soon to learn is she was a, a demanding one also. When, when she said to me, clean, I heard her say, tidy. You know, wash the dishes, pick up your shoes, flush the toilet sweep the kitchen floor, and then just leave all the dirt that you swept up in a very neat pile in the corner. Well, mum had a fit when she saw my efforts. She literally marched me around the entirety of the home, showing me what cleaning products were effective in each particular area. She even lifted the rug in, in the kitchen, checking for dirt underneath it. Needless to say that that particular economic arrangement was quite short-lived. Now, all these things I knew about mum, her work ethic, 
her ridiculously clean home, her love of history and family, her kindness and tenderness. But there were two things that I learned only when I was older. Mum couldn't drive a car. She didn't even have a licence. But that didn't stop her from telling you how to drive a car. I am thankful I was exposed to this grievous character flaw just occasionally when her full-time chauffeur was unavailable. But my poor dad, he, he, he literally copped a life sentence of gentle automotive rebukes and corrections. And then the other thing that I only really fully come to grips with when I got older, and it's not an insignificant issue, was mum's cooking. Let's just say, even though my dad was no chef and had no variety, and when I mean no variety, I mean he'd just serve up bangers and mash and gravy, or what he would dubiously call fry-ups, which were just scraps of food and potato thrown into a frying pan. And then I come to work out later, they were mostly leftovers from the bangers and mash from the night before, and they're basically thrown into a fry pan, fried around for a few minutes, and then unceremoniously dumped on your plate. Though, in fairness to my dad, my dad could make decent Yorkshire puddings. <laughs> Not as good as mine. Mine are on a totally different level to dad's. But they were pretty good. You could see what they were, that they were, they were edible. Which, to be honest, was not a regular expectation when it comes to mum's cooking. So mercifully... Later in life, I have to say, Dad did most of the cooking. I've always, been, always had this nagging suspicion that Mum's cooking got intentionally worse. I mean, now she had both a chef and a chauffeur. There are deep affections for Mum. I guess most, if not all mums, they love sacrificially. They're kind and tender and warm and present and thoughtful and generous. And, and because mums tend to be like that, they elicit from you this loyalty and respect and love. And that was certainly true of my mum. And for that, I'm so very, very thankful to God. I'm going to ask my wife, Ruth, if she'd like to come up and say a few words. public speaking, <laughs> but alas, here I am. Uh, I don't want to take up too much time, but um, I didn't want today to go by without honouring my beautiful mother-in-law. I've been so blessed to have Joe and Margaret as my in-laws. They have loved me as their own. I love the term that the Geordies use, our Darren our Viv, our Grace, <laughs> our Bands, and our Ruth, and I'm one of them. <laughs> Margaret was kind, gracious, loving, so patient and intuitive. As we raised lots of our small children, Jo and Margaret would come and stay with us for a week at a time, and she knew just what I needed. She would tend to the children, take them for walks, clean, wash, fold. I think this was her superpower. <laughs> Um, I'd turn around and my house was spotless. <laughs> what young mum wouldn't appreciate that? She was also a great friend. We would spend many hours talking over the kitchen sink or folding mountains of washing. She loved to tell stories about her family here and in England. And I always used to joke that I knew more about Darren's family than he did. <laughs> she was a great storyteller and a reader. She passed on her love of reading and books to all of her grandchildren. And I remember their excitement when she would turn up with bags of books from the op shop. She also loved to bless us with her beautiful handmade quilts. And I've put a few of them around today just so you can see all the love that she's put into them. I think she made one for each of the kids as well. <laughs> um, and credit to Grandad because he used to sit there very patiently hand stitching all the, <laughs> the quilting that had to be done on the frame that he made for her. Um, we will all miss her very dearly. She was, a, she was generous of heart and we were privileged that she was ours. Tara, our beautiful Nana.
This is great. Yep. Happy with her. Well, unlike mum, I don't have public speaking and I've got a captive audience, so why not go for it? Um, unfortunately, I've been outfield this week, so I haven't had a chance to actually prepare something. I sort of just flown in last minute. Um, but just reflecting, I think I want to make it really clear how much we all love Nana. Um, all us grandkids were so, so blessed to have her in our life. Um, when I look back to being younger, I used to, I didn't quite appreciate it at the time, but I've had superhero grandparents. Like, every month, Nana and Grandad would come down to visit us at least, and it used to be the highlight of my existence. To be fair, we lived in Bort, which had, like, an IGA, and that was it, so the bar wasn't high. But um, having them come down made so much um, to my childhood. I think a lot of those pivotal points um, centred around Nana and Grandad. They'd do this thing where, um, like, I think Mum and Dad have already talked about how much she loved books and reading. And I think I was that freakish child at the age of four who'd already learnt to read. And despite that, um, she used to sit down and read to us and just hours, hours over weekends. And I came to realise it was actually um, a grateful measure on her part. Pretty much gave Mum a couple of hours to remind herself that she herself was human. And it was just a little break, but for us it was awesome. Um, she, we used to do this thing, we used to go on walks with Grandad and Nana. And um, we had these old abandoned pipes and looking back, probably was no H and S compliant, but Grandad used to send us into them. There'd be cobwebs and spiders everywhere, and it used to set the setting. We'd all be like freaked out, and he'd be like, "All right, you're not coming. We're not going home until you tell us a story." And I think from a very young age, um, Nana and Grandad built into us that sense of adventure, the sense of hanging out with each other, and that fun could be simple, um, and that family really was the best. And Michaela used to steal all our stories. Joe and I were definitely the best. Um, and then we used to all trundle back home, and we do that all the time. They'd take us on walks to the botanical gardens, to the shops, to the beach occasionally. Nana didn't like the beach that much, so we didn't do that too much. But anyway, um, she used to like... I remember she told me about a shark once. I don't think she'd ever seen one, but she told me it nearly ate Dad once, so we didn't go to the beach much. Um, and I think just all those little things throughout your childhood, you don't really appreciate until you get older. And as I moved out of home and I moved away... Um, Sorry, I'm not usually a sook. Um, I didn't see much of Nana and Granite as much, um, but the, when I was able to come back, that used to still be a highlight. I used to go over for Granddad's interesting dinners. Tell you what, that man, Nana definitely can't cook. She can't cook. But Granddad is very inventive, especially in these past few years. You turn up and be random sandwiches and concoctions and broths <laughs> that <laughs> you just don't ask. You don't ask. You just eat it and don't ask. Um, and we'd sit out on the deck, and especially in her older age, Nana loved to tell us more about our family and where we came from. And it was really interesting seeing that change from... I always saw her as just my Nana, who looked after me and was a bit of a softie and gave me, you know, pocket coin money and sandwiches and books and lollies when Mum wasn't looking. And suddenly I began to see her more as this incredible woman who'd lived an incredible life, it literally wasn't until the day that I told her I joined the army. She said, oh, I used to be in the army too. I was like, what? <laughs> literally, I got my entire life without knowing my name was in the army until the day I joined. And um, just more things like that. She began telling me about her childhood, about some of her friends. She told me about uh, meeting Grandad and what a dashing young man he was in a little bit too much detail for my liking. But anyway, um, <laughs> and I began to see her, especially her relationship with Grandad, and she loved you so much. Um, and I think for me, getting to see that side of the woman she was was so special. And I know that was for all of us grandkids as well. Um, I know Grandad, every time I come and visit, one of the other grandkids would have been around. I know Kayla's been harassing you a lot lately. Um, <laughs> but I think despite that, it's because we love you and we love everything that you've done um, in our childhoods and the opportunity and the influence um, that you took there with us is something we'll never, ever be able to repay. And so for that, I know you can't hear me, but I love you, Nana. And I know we all do. Thank you for that, Grace, Ruth. See, Mum was well-loved. Uh, she lived uh, a full life. Um, we're going to give thanks for that life now. I'm going to lead you in a time of prayer. As Christians, we believe that God gives us life. God watches over our lives. God indeed directs our lives. 
and also our deaths. And so we're going to, uh, we're going to bow before the Lord in prayer. Let's, let's pray and give thanks for mum's life. Father, you uh, are the giver of all good gifts. We thank you particularly for the gift of life itself, the precious uh, ties of kinship, friendship, uh, the joy of human affections and, and love, and particularly we want to thank you for the life of Margaret Middleton, whom you have taken from us. We thank you for her warmth, her kindness, her abundant love for her family and friends. Thank you that she was diligent and hardworking, sacrificial in her service. And there was a, a gentleness and a grace about her of which we are eternally thankful. We thank you for her resilience despite a life that had many, many challenges. Thank you how she cared and took her great interest in others, including the decades of charity work. We thank you for her simple faith and for the warm mother's heart that permeated all our relationships. Father, we confess a, a deep sadness that at the end of her life, afflicted with dementia, which stole from her all that was familiar to us until finally taking her life. But we rest in the knowledge that she has entered into your presence with great joy and we look forward to the day that we shall see her again. Would you grant all her family, both here in the UK, especially my dad, Joe, that would you grant them grace and comfort during this time? Would you bless her children and her grandchildren, her siblings, all of her family, that, that they might know those promises and the hope of the gospel? Indeed, grant to us all grace and thankfulness so that each one of us might be able to say, the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Amen. Well, we're going to sing again. Uh, the next song we're going to sing is, is probably one that a lot of people are not familiar with. Um, it was written by a, a, fa a fellow called Shane Everett. And he, he wrote this song uh, after the sudden death of his father. And he, he explains how uh, he watched his mother, who was uh, newly converted, and literally banging on his chest as she cried out, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And so then he penned these words, and they're appropriate words for us to sing today, Though You Slay Me. I come, God, I come, return to the Lord, the one who's broken, the one who's torn. Apart. You struck me down to bind me up. You say you'd do it all in love, that I might know you in your suffering. For you save me, yet I will praise you though you take from me. I will bless
Though tonight I'm crying out, let this cup pass from me now. You're still more than I need. You're enough for me. You're enough. God hears us, but we also believe he speaks to us and he does that through his word. So I'm going to ask um, Isaiah, um, obviously mum's grandson, he'll come forward and he's going to read to us uh, mum's favourite psalm, Psalm 23. Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I must have read that psalm to mum so many times, uh, in her room, at her bedside. Some of those times she was cognizant of that and was agreeable and thankful, would ask me to pray. But in the last months, just read those words. It, it's, a, it's a psalm. <clears throat> that tells you what God is like. And it does it because the psalmist knows, in this case it's King David, he knows that the darkness will come. That death will crouch at our doors, that sadness will take up residence. He knows that, that each of us are called to walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Yet he wants God's people to know that you are not overcome, not overwhelmed, but most of all, certainly not all alone. Because the psalmist tells us that God is like a shepherd. And if we were to listen to his voice, he would lead us. In the psalm, the psalmist says, the Lord is my shepherd. He's not just a shepherd. This is personal. It's, it's intimate. He is my shepherd. I know his voice. And I know that he cares for me and he guides me and he loves me. He goes on to say how he would lead me in paths of righteousness. And where I want to just spend a little bit of time is just verse 4. And so, saying all these things, he then has this contrast, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Literally in the Hebrew, it means, even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness. It doesn't just mean death. It could be any, any hardship, difficulty, trial, but certainly death is the pinnacle of that. Even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness, even though it feels like the dead of night, even when faced with moments, seasons even, of hardship and heartache and suffering and sickness and depression and death, and even though I walk through the valley of deepest darkness, even so, he says, I will fear no evil. 
The poet Dylan Thomas spoke of his fear of death and separation when he wrote, Do not go gentle into that good night. Rage, rage against the dying of the light. And I guess if you believe that death is it, that this life is it, and death is the end and the pinnacle, if you like, of the, the deepest darkness, then yes, rage, rage, rage against the dying of the light against the valley of deepest darkness. But not so for David. David says, I I will fear no evil. He he doesn't say, I won't encounter it. I won't endure it. I I won't taste it. He says, I won't fear it. It won't control me. It won't destroy me. It won't embitter me. Why? Why? If he's to walk through this valley of the deepest darkness, why will he not fear? And he tells you, he gives you the reason. For you are with me. Because the shepherd walks with me in the valley. Because God walks with me in my deepest darkness. Because God is with me in the dead of the night. It's like when you're little and you're scared. And your dad takes hold of your hand. It's just securing. Or your mum picks you up and you know how she holds you so tight. And just then, at that moment, you just never felt so secure, so comforted, so certain even. It's comforting because you know you're loved. And not just loved, but but secure. And here is the... The psalmist, David, and he's saying, we're like, we're like sheep. God is like a shepherd. Children, they're like sh- sheep are vulnerable. And if sheep didn't have a shepherd to guide and protect them, they would be easy targets for predators. Essentially, sheep can't defend themselves. Nor are they the sharpest tool in the shed. And here is David, and he says, God is like a shepherd. We're like sheep. And he guides and provides and he leads and protects. And even though I walk through the valley of the deepest darkness, I will fear no evil for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. And again, you know the imagery. The, the, the shepherd's rod is used to defend the sheep. It's to, it's to beat off the predators. And his staff is used to direct the sheep. That's what's comforting. He's painting a picture of walking through these dark valleys, but you're not on your own because you've got a shepherd. And even though you might be lost, the shepherd's not lost and the shepherd knows where you're going. So the psalmist says, I will not fear because God is with me, shepherding, providing, leading, protecting. When you get to the New Testament, Jesus picks up this imagery of Psalm 23 And when talking to the crowds, he says to them, I am the good shepherd. I am the good shepherd of which David spoke. Because the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The Bible says in Isaiah 53, 6, that we all like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. You have, I have, mum had. that God has sent his shepherd into the world, that those who hear his voice, that he might gather them, save them, lead them, protect them, love them, and walk with them and guide them through the deepest darkness, even the valley of the shadow of death. In those last months of mum's life, the good shepherd walked mum through that valley. Actually, He carried mum through that valley. But the valley of deepest darkness, of the shadow of death, it's not a place that invites platitudes or sentimentality. When you're facing death, there's actually no place for empty, meaningless words that just literally disappear into the darkness. 
just nice thoughts. We actually don't need platitudes or sentimentality. What we actually need is a God who cares, a God who loves, a God who comes to our aid, who rides through the skies in his majesty to rescue us, to help us, to guide and provide, to lead and protect. That's what comforts, not not platitudes or sentimentality, not poems or songs, not denial or rage, not even flowers or wine. Though, let me put a good word in, wine does bring a measure of comfort. So please forward wine at your earliest convenience. But it's a good shepherd that comforts. David points us to a God who cares, a God who loves, a God who actually seeks and saves. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And if you were to hear his voice today, you would come to him in repentance and faith and he would give you life and he would guide and lead you through any valley. Just like we did with Mark. That's why David concludes, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Well, that was mum's comfort. Mum wasn't a theologian, though she did like to read. But she knew God was good. She knew Christ had loved her and died for her. And she knew that if she put her faith in him, that death is not the last word. It certainly is not, nor is dementia. But there is hope beyond the grave. And that mum has already entered into that glory, into that rest. And for that, we give thanks to God and we rejoice. And it It mitigates the pain. (laughs) Instead of it being a farce and a a final farewell, it's, we'll see you soon. God willing. Faith enables you to say it as well with my soul, even in the deepest darkness. We're going to sing just in a moment a beautiful song, Mum, love this old hymn. It's about, written about 150 years ago. It's, it, it is well with my soul. Many of you know the story behind it, but it was, it was penned by a bloke called Horatio Spafford. He was an elder in the Chicago Presbyterian Church. And he was also a very well-known and wealthy lawyer who had significant wealth in real estate. In 1870, Spafford was what you would say a truly blessed man. He had a strong faith, a loving wife, five children, and a great deal of wealth. But then late in the 1870s, Spafford's four-year-old son, Horatio Jr., died of scarlet fever. The Spaffords were devastated. But their troubles had only just begun. The following October in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire swept through and destroyed much of Chicago, including all of the Spafford's real estate. And because of the death of their son and the loss of their wealth, Spafford arranged for his family to visit relatives in London to ease the pain. The day in November that they were due to depart, Spafford had a last-minute business transaction caused him to remain in Chicago. Nevertheless, he sent his wife and four daughters to travel as scheduled, expecting to follow them in the days ahead. On November 22, the ship laden with his wife and daughters was struck by the Lockhorn, an English vessel, and it sank in just a few minutes. Over 200 souls were drowned, including Spafford's four daughters, Annie, Maggie, Bessie and Tanita. Upon reaching the shores of England, Mrs. Spafford sent a telegram which read, Saved alone. Husband caught the next ship across to be with her. And it is said, when the boat stopped at the point where the sinking had occurred, Spafford wrote those famous lines 
to his hymn. When peace like a river flows all through my life, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, you have taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Well, let's do that even now. Let's stand and we'll sing together a song of response. Jesus, the good shepherd, that he might grant us that confidence to sing.
we come to the end of our service and there's all that's left to us to do is to commit mum to the Lord. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. For as much as it has pleased Almighty God to take the soul of Margaret Middleton to himself, we here commit her body to be returned to the element, earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust, to await the general resurrection at the last day through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest and abide with each and every one of you this day and as you move forward. Now, please stay. Uh, service is now concluded. I just encourage you to hang around. We'll bring out some food, tea and coffee and just mingle around and catch up with family. Thank you all for coming today.